Hello and welcome to the Fortified Podcast with author and pastor Dr. David Harrell. In our last episode together, we discussed the doctrine of biblical regeneration. We looked at things like repentance and what that is, and today we're going to pick back up with our discussion on spiritual discernment. We pray you're edified by this conversation, and we hope you enjoy. We are to build ourselves up doctrinally. My friends, this is a call for personal edification so that you can grow strong spiritually, so that you can become mature, to get serious about strengthening our ability to discern and fortify our defenses against deception. If we were to think about discernment amongst believers, we were talking about young, young people in the faith, um, what would you say hinders new believers in their discernment? Uh, l- lack of, of biblical knowledge. Okay. They do not understand Bible doctrine. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're weak in their uh, ability to grasp the great truths of scripture and frankly in most cases they don't understand the gospel sure i i talk to so many people not not just young people but older people and we we get them coming routinely to the church who have come out of churches where, where they've never been taught anything beyond noah's ark and jonah and the whale and <laughs> daniel and the lion's den and 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 you need to tithe you know i mean that's that's right. kind of you know and and, and they suddenly get immersed in the magnificent truths of, of Scripture through Bible exposition. Hmm. And you hear, you know, a lot of these people, even in our church and in others, they, they just come away saying, I just never understood any of that. I never right. knew any of that. And so um, discernment only comes uh, when we discipline ourselves for the sake of godliness, Amen. as Paul told Timothy. Mm-hmm. And that discipline requires uh, the systematic, in-depth study of the Word of God, being under good Bible expositors, being in good Bible-believing churches where Mm. where the the Word is very carefully and expounded and explained and applied. And then what you have are people that mature in Christ, and then you're around those people and, and and God uses the fellowship of his people. I mean, we're part of the body of Christ, and he uses that to help us grow even more. Amen. Yeah. So to answer your question, it, young people, or anybody for that matter, you simply must be in a good, solid Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church mm-hmm. with godly people, and you must spend time around them. You need to be discipled. You need to be learning. And real practically, I tell people, if you're not reading, you're not growing. Okay, yeah. I mean, you constantly need to be reading uh, great, everything from uh, uh, great uh, biographies to uh, church history. Uh, You need to be listening to godly podcasts. You need to have, you know, three or four Bible expositors in particular Mm. that you're constantly listening to. And because what you see, it's the Spirit of God is going to use these types of things to help you understand and thereby grow yes sir yeah as you mentioned earlier second corinthians 3 as we behold his glory in his word we're being transformed into his likeness yeah and and that's why peter said also that that we need to be like like newborn babes right yeah we need to long for the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby Mm -hmm. and uh what's amazing about uh solid deep bible exposition is that for the believer, you can't get enough of it. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> and now, for non-believers, when they hear that, it's like, oh, gee, I feel like I'm in a seminary. I don't want to hear all sure, that stuff. Sure, sure. Man, for the believer, it's like, I can't get enough of this. Right. And and that's like the newborn babe. I mean, <laughs> mama's milk is a matter of life and death. You sure. Know? That's where nourishment's found. And, and, and it's the same thing not only with the being uh, uh, immersed in good Bible teaching, but but also just your own private personal pursuit of holiness. Mm-hmm. You you know you you're not going to grow 
unless you are serious about communing with the Lord in prayer Hmm. and your own study of the Word, your own private worship, I call it your own secret devotion to God. I mean, you're just not going to grow. Sure. You know, you can have all the externals, but uh, who you are before God on your knees is really who you are. Amen. And then you also need, as, as I say, other godly people to fellowship with mm-hmm. because so often uh, we learn more by what's caught than taught, you sure. know? Sure. We see things that are modeled. Yeah. And uh, I can give you a thousand examples of that. And I'm sure you could too. Well, I was going to say, man, just being under your expositional uh, Bible teaching for a number of years now and then watching the fidelity of your life. It has changed my life. So I attest to all of that. Well, we yeah. give God the glory for that. And Amen. I can say that about so many others too. Yeah. And uh, that that's how the Lord grows his, his people. Sure. I mean, it, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. But if you're not in that kind of an environment and if you're not doing those types of things, then you are vulnerable. Yeah. And the enemy is going to going to trick you up very quickly because there's all kinds of deceptions out there. I mean, you just pick your poison. Sure, sure. <laughs> all over the internet, all over television. Yeah. So. Oh man, and and you meant okay. So you've you've given us some great stuff with regards to the reason the reason that people lack discernment even as believers is a lack of biblical literacy, uh, not being in a healthy church, being under faithful biblical teaching, uh, and and then secret devotion to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, one reason for the lack of discernment within the church today that I see is that people don't believe that the meaning of Scripture is even attainable. So you'll hear things like, uh, well, that's, that's your interpretation, or it can mean one thing to you and another thing to me. What, what advice or what counsel would you give to someone who believed that? Well, first of all, they're believing a lie. Mm-hmm because there is the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, it is understandable. Yeah. It, it is not some mysterious uh, piece of literature that is incomprehensible. Right. You know, no. And, and it is, however, to the unbeliever. Sure. The natural you know, man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. Yeah. yeah there, it's foolishness to him mm-hmm. because he's spiritually appraised. He has, in other words, he has no capacity to discern truth, to, to make a verdict on something. It's a, that was a, a judicial term. Hmm. Um, and even when the evidence is obvious, they, they, they can't see it, they won't embrace it. Right. It doesn't say that they have a hard time. It says, and they cannot understand mm-hmm. and because they're spiritual appraise, spiritually appraised. The Spirit of God is the one that will, will uh, 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 illumine the heart of man. Um, and so, you know, to, back to what you're saying, when, when people say, well, you just can't under, understand Scripture, that's your interpretation. Uh, I always say, um, you, you know, it, it's not just my interpretation, it, it's what the Scripture says. Right. right. It, it's what it says. And there's, there's always only one meaning. Now, there can be multiple applications, but there's only one meaning. Mm-hmm. And so now you get into an issue of hermeneutics, the science and art of biblical interpretation. Mm-hmm. And so you have to look at, you know, the authorial intent. You have to look at the context. You have to uh, look at the, at the grammar, the syntax. I mean, all of those types of things. And, and you're used to that. You're, you're, you're used to being sitting under you know, expository teaching and preaching and, right. and do it yourself, you mm-hmm. know, teaching it yourself now as a young man. And right. we have so many others. And, and so you see that. Mm-hmm. And, and so people that will say that typically have some agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to believe, for example, that uh, because God loves everybody, uh, the whole LGBTQ cult is acceptable. Mm. And so they're going to distort, and, and even though you point out the, the passages, you know, they will have, you know, five reasons why, well, that's not what it means, or well, that's what it meant back then, or, right. or the Apostle Paul was, you know, he was way out there. <laughs> uh, and God doesn't mean what he said in Leviticus 18, where he sandwiched homosexuality uh, in, in between uh, child sacrifice and bestiality. Mm-hmm. You know, no, he doesn't mean, so they, right. they will do it because they have an agenda. Right. But, um, but when you apply the, uh, a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic hmm. to Scripture, you'll find that, that it has one meaning. <laughs> and now there's going to be some things that we're not real sure about. Sure. 
and and I can see that. Um, and but 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 on the on the essentials, on the major doctrinal truths of Scripture, I mean, it, it is so clear, like the gospel. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think in, in 2 Timothy 3, when Paul says that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for reproof and correction and training in righteousness, he's assuming that it's going to be able to be understood, right? Otherwise, course. it's not profitable, huh? Uh, of, of course, and to say otherwise is to impugn the, the character of God, right? that he breathed out an incomprehensible document. <laughs> sure. You know? Sure. When Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross in John 17, he, he prayed to the Father, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Right. So, you, you know, otherwise, how, why, why would he have prayed that? Sure. Or how could he have prayed that if it's some incomprehensible that means different things to di different people? Hmm. And I remember years ago, I was around some folks where, it's kind of the old joke, but this was literally true. It's like, well, what does that verse mean to you? Yeah. Rather than, well, what does that verse mean? Right. What did it mean to the author? What did it mean to the original listeners, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. That's what it means, mm -hmm. not what you think it means. <laughs> and boy, isn't it interesting? We, we were talking about Hitler earlier, or maybe I used the illustration that even Hitler did some good things. Uh, but... Hitler used the Bible to do a lot of, justify a lot of what he did. Right. You know, it's just right. nuts. Mm -hmm. And you see all these false teachers doing the same thing. I mean, the whole prosperity cult yeah. that's out there. I mean, all of that is blatantly unbiblical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to be discerning. Yeah. And the, the scripture is profitable. Amen. Yeah. yeah, that's that's helpful, man. So, so uh, and, and as you mentioned, it's something, hermeneutics is something that you will, you will, you will get in a in a good Bible believing Bible teaching. Yeah, you're going to see it all the time, right? And you learn to do that. Yeah, I can't tell you how many Sundays. It's probably without fail every Sunday since we've been at Calvary. Just uh, let me remind you of the context, or here's what this word means, or here's the historical situation. You know, yeah. And I'll get those yeah. details, and that's just that's incredibly helpful for discerning sure it is. meaning. It, it is for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, otherwise you just make stuff up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like the shirt that my uh, my my kids gave me for Father's Day, <laughs> with Papa, if he, if he doesn't know the answer, he just makes stuff up real fast. You know, <laughs> that's, that's not the job of the preacher. No, huh? no, not at all. Okay, well, I, that's so helpful. Uh, I remember in Acts 17, the Bereans are commended by the Apostle Paul mm. because they were testing what he was saying against Scripture to see whether or not it was true. Yeah. I wonder if you could help us. I'm going to give you a few situations and help us be Bereans, man. Okay. I'll give you some some general situations and maybe just respond however you want to. Help us think through these things biblically. So the first one, my family and I are new believers looking for a church. I pass one on my way to work every day with a sign out front which reads, Reverend Sally Johnson. Is there anything from that initial look that helps me know whether or not I should bring my family there? Yeah, you would never go to a church like that because right on the billboard it says that we disregard the authority of Scripture. How so? Well, Second Timothy 2 tells us that Paul says that women are not allowed to exercise authority or to teach men. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just part of, of what God has said in his word with respect to male-female role relationships, headship, submission, which is reflected in the Trinity. Right. And so... And so he has, he has reasons for all of that. But, but, but when you have, suddenly you have a woman preacher, well, she has to disregard, you know, what God has said. Right. And, and there's other, other things we won't maybe get into all of that. But, sure. but the, the, the point is that's not the role of a woman. That's the role that God has given a man. The, right. the qualifications of an elder uh, uh, and and First Timothy 3, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my point is, right off the bat, I know that there is a disregard for the authority of Scripture. Right. And, and I have learned over the years that there's two things that I will break fellowship over mm -hmm. with other people that claim to be Christians. If they disregard the authority of Scripture, and if they're errant on the gospel. Okay. If, if they somehow preach a different gospel you know, out right. of there on that. Right. Okay. So that would be the first thing that I would say. And I'm sure if you start peeling back that onion, 
you're going to find a whole lot of feminism, a whole lot of social justice, a whole lot of uh, woke. Right. Other and that, unbiblical, unbiblical teaching. Yeah, huh? yeah. Because wherever you see uh, women preachers, for example, in, in the Bible, uh, that's always a sign of defection. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Uh, the next situation. I'm preparing to bring my family to a church near me whose website advertises that they are a spirit-filled church. Upon our first visit, we look, and during the opening songs, there are people falling down in a kind of euphoria or emotional frenzy, and even some individuals speaking in tongues. After the sermon, a man gets up and says he's received a word of wisdom from the Lord about the upcoming events in the life of the church. Do I continue to bring my family to that church? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, there you're describing some of the uh, some of the excesses that we see in the charismatic movement, certainly the Pentecostal movement, um, uh, movements where where one's truth claims are validated by experience rather than by the Word of God. Right. And there's just so much wrong with even the things you were describing there, where where somehow when you come to saving faith in Christ. Uh, there's still something incomplete. Hmm. You need to do something to get more of the Spirit because it's insufficient. What you have is insufficient, so you need something more. Hmm. The fact that you, you've been eternally united to Christ, ah, that's not enough. You need more <laughs> of the Spirit. And Oh, and by the way, the way you can, you can know you get more of the Spirit is you learn to, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, bada, Yamaha. You start right. making up all this stuff, and there, there's so much wrong with that whole charismatic movement I, mm. is like, where do you even begin mm. with it? Um, but certainly the legacy of the charismatic movement is a disregard for Bible doctrine okay. and a focus on the Holy Spirit rather than on Christ and, and a disregard for the authority of Scripture and, and all of those types of things. Right. So I would absolutely, I wouldn't walk, I would run from okay. that type of a church. Okay, all right. Last situation I'll give to you. Okay. It's my second month attending a local non-denominational church in my area. During the sermon, the pastor simply reads a verse or two of the Bible and then walks through how it pertains to the topic for the week. Things like marriage, discipline, and success. I appreciate the kindness of the folks here, and due to the size of the church, doesn't that mean that God is blessing it? No, it doesn't mean. Um, size is never a measure of faithfulness to the church. Hmm. Um, faithfulness is always measured by a love for Christ, by a commitment to sound doctrine, uh, you know, belief in the true gospel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, it's hard to know from what you're saying there, but for the most part, what I'm hearing is kind of a, a very superficial type of, of, a, of a sermon where you're, you're not really taking people into the depths of the word to help them see the riches therein. And I, I call that the one, two, three method of, of, uh, of preaching. You, you, you have one verse, you've got two jokes and three stories. <laughs> and it, it, it gets so boring and so, mm. I mean, it's, it's cotton candy sermonettes for Christianettes. People aren't going to grow with that. Right. And after a while, it's, it's just going to, be kind of the same old, same old, but a lot of people like that because, A, that attracts non-believers, hmm. that type of thing, where you, you kind of round off the sharp edges of the gospel so that somehow everybody's going to feel more loved, right? Right. You want to take away the offense of the gospel. You want to be more therapeutic. You want to be more psychological. Hmm. Uh, you, you want to be more... Um, uh, uh, gracious to them, make them feel good about themselves. People don't want to come here and hear, come to hear about their sin and they need to <laughs> repent and there's a hell. And you know, so in other words, you, you really set aside the gospel right. and instead you give them this man-centered um, silliness and entertainment. Right. And that's what fills up churches. And that's been one of the great uh, deceptions that uh, Satan has brought to evangelicalism, mm. this whole pragmatic movement right. that basically says uh, um, uh, entertaining people uh, and making them feel good about themselves is a better strategy uh, f for evangelism than giving them the gospel. Right. 
And, I mean, you can fill up churches, but there's a big difference between a true church and a crowd. Mm-hmm. And most of those places are nothing more than than um, kind of Christian social clubs. Sure. sure. And so you want to be real, real careful with that. Man, it's so well said. And you mentioned earlier, I, th- I think about, about this when discerning whether or not a song is a good song. Mm. Is it man-centered or is this yeah. Christ-centered? Is this helping lift my eyes away from myself and yeah. to, to the glory of Christ? Or is this really just puffing me yeah. up? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, you know, so often the, the motivation for music in, in so many of these churches is, is to somehow... Um, whip people up emotionally, right. you know, um, to somehow induce worship rather than express it. Right, that's helpful. And, and there's, uh, there, there's, there's no transcendence in most churches today. Hmm. There, there is no overwhelming sense of coming into the presence of the Most High God, the, the Creator, the Sustainer, um, the the deliverer, uh, the the redeemer, uh, the consummator of all things, right. and and to somehow be so struck with reverential awe that you just you just feel like you need to be on your face. Amen. And then in the midst of that, you can be all the more overwhelmed by His saving grace. Yeah. And that's what produces real worship. Yeah. And yeah. then based on that, you want to hear. I mean, people that truly love Christ. They're longing for the glory and the greatness of God. Mm -hmm. And you will only see that through the the in-depth exposition of his word, Mm -hmm. the glorious truths of his word being proclaimed. And that's why Paul said that that everything else was (laughs) rubbish, Rubbish. right? Compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and that's the only way you're going to know him. And so if you come into a church that's man-centered, rather than God-centered, mm-hmm. that's uh, anthropocentric rather than theopocentric. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm ready for my water now, right? That's right. That's um, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. Yeah. But that's what attracts most people because they're not there to truly worship in spirit and truth. They're there to somehow ha- feel good about themselves and gotcha. be kind of pumped up emotionally and and uh, that's how they measure whether or not the spirit is at work. You know how what how much of a frenzy of emotion do you get into, and right. and all of that type of thing. And so, that is a very very dangerous deception that has filled up churches with non-believers. Okay. And that's what Jesus warned about in Matthew seven that most people who call themselves Christians will never enter the kingdom. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you for, for modeling that discernment for yeah. us here. Uh, and just and you've given us some great principles about this already, but maybe just briefly, what, what are we looking for when we look for a good church? If I'm a young believer, how, how would you counsel someone uh, in, you know, who's looking for a yeah, biblical church? A, a high view of God, a high view of Scripture, okay. and, and a very clear... Uh, and bold proclamation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, People that are committed to to holiness, people that uh, truly honor the Lord, and you see it in their lives. Amen. You see see people that that want to be separate from the world. Mm -hmm. You know, again, this idea that we've got to become like the world in order to win it, I mean, that's just a lie. Yeah. And so look for a church that has a high view of God, a high view of Scripture, uh, a very clear, bold proclamation of, of the gospel. And then along with that, obviously you want to look at their doctrinal statement, but mm. the, the, so many times people have a great doctrinal statement, but what you see lived out is like, oh my word, that's is something different. But you have, to, you, you have to get to know some of the key people. Mm. Um, and if you want to get real practical, I tell people, uh, ask the pastor and ask the elders, uh, who are, are, are some of the men that have had the greatest impact on your life? Okay. Who do you read? Mm-hmm. Who do you follow? Uh, and then that begins to tell me right. um, a whole lot. And, and then I want, to listen to, I want to listen to them preach. 
uh, one of the, the big dangers in so many churches when they call a pastor is they call a guy and he comes in to, to preach the best sermon that he's ever developed. You know, that's like the, he's got, you know, one shot basically, <laughs> but, but you need to, to listen to, to, you know, a dozen sermons over, you know, just pick them out randomly. You right. know, how does this guy deal with the text? Okay. And then also I would look for a, a church that disciplines sin. <laughs> Do they practice church discipline? From Matthew 18. Absolutely. Because that tells you that they're, they're serious about purity in the church. Right. And so those types of things. And then I also tell people, talk with other godly pastors that you know, that you respect, and see if they know anything about that church. Okay. And have them also do some check. I get this all, I bet you every week, somebody will say, what do you know about so-and-so and and such and such a church? Well, I'm not real sure. Yeah, because my aunt lives there and they're thinking about going there. Would you mind checking them out? Right. So I'll do a little bit of checking as best I can and, and, you know, offer my two cents, so to speak. Man, okay. <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, one, one thing I think about, we were talking about the Reformers earlier and the Puritans. Uh, they, they articulated the regulative principle that Scripture, uh, everything that we do in our corporate worship must be warranted by Scripture, either by command, preach the Word, you know, give, mm-hmm. give attention to the public reading of Scripture, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or by example. We see it exemplified in the text. Um, and so we're, this isn't a free-for-all. We don't just decide what to do, oh, yeah. but we, we let Scripture. Yeah, and, and essentially it's going to cover the things that I just talked about. Right. You know, you're going to see, you're, you're going to see um, throughout Scripture um, when, when people come to worship, I mean, there's the reading of the Word of God. Mm-hmm. There is the exposition of the Word of God. There, are, there is singing the Word of God. There is fellowship. There's the ordinances of, of baptism and the Lord's Supper and, you know, those types of things, a, a, a commitment to purity within the church. I mean, the first thing Jesus did after the church was, was formed is uh, what you see is the whole deal with Ananias and Sapphira, you know. Right. And right. so he's concerned about that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's not like, well, let's just go in and let's just do church. And most of the time what you see and what most people like is just kind of a glorified, superficial, worldly youth group type of thing. It's gotcha. It's... It's it's so uh, juvenile mm-hmm. and superficial and kind of a rock concert kind of you know that's what a lot of people want and they think boy now we're really doing church right but in right. reality they're 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 not bowing before a holy God and and really celebrating His grace and wanting to know more of who Christ is and hmm. and have a burden for the lost and, you know, all of those types of things. Gotcha. That's wonderful. All right, brother. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for walking us through that. Uh, you were talking about pragmatism earlier. In speaking about satanic deception within the church today, you say on page 46 of this book, far too often we hear a misguided cry for ecclesiastical unity but this can only be accomplished at the expense of sound doctrine, what Paul defined as the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This has produced a mongrel church bereft of spiritual discernment and power. Would you elaborate on that reality within the church today and maybe comment on how postmodernism has impacted the church there? Yeah, sure. I mean, you, what you were just reading, well, that's, that's Ephesians 4, mm-hmm. essentially. And... Um, I mean, postmodernism basically says there's no such thing as absolute truth. Right. You know, you make up your own truth. You can be whoever you want to be. So, so there, there, there's no ultimate moral authority, Mm -hmm. and so that is completely anti-Christian, right? Anti-God, and um, so what's happened is is people grow up hearing that. And, and and rejecting any kind of spiritual moral authority mm-hmm. for a thousand different reasons. And now what you have is what we see, uh, you know, in our world today. Mm-hmm. People just making up stuff, doing whatever they want to do. Well, all of that then filters into the church. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't have good solid doctrine and you, you constantly are telling the people, this is what God requires. This is what honors him. Mm-hmm. If they don't know that, then they just start bringing in all this stuff into the church. Right. And so now you can kind of believe whatever you want to believe. Mm-hmm. And 
that's why so many churches today have no moral authority. Yeah. And in fact, this is what Satan is using to deceive so many people because people think that this is really what God says. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not at all what God says. Mm -hmm. And so that's the danger of, of, of what we're talking about here. Um, with allowing this type of stuff, especially because of postmodernism. Okay. okay. Yeah, no moral authority. You can believe whatever you want to believe, no matter how absurd or contradictory it might be. The one thing you can't believe is biblical Christianity. Right, right. Because that's way too narrow. Mm -hmm. There's only one way yeah. to the Father through Christ. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yes, rejecting postmodernism and the way it's infiltrated the church, but... Even within genuine believers, there's disagreement on some of these some of these topics. Um, are there are there uh, issues that we can disagree on and still maintain oh, genuine course. Christian yeah. fellowship? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know we we can't disagree on the essentials. Yeah. You know, there's going to be other things of preference or or even some doctrinal things that we're we're not completely sure of. Uh, you go to eschatology, for example. Sure. Uh, I, I am very committed to a, 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 a premillennial position. Mm -hmm. I believe there is a distinction between Israel and the church and, and all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are others who, who don't agree with that. They think the, the church has permanently uh, superseded uh, Israel. And so they have an amillennial perspective or a postmillennial. I mean, you've got some nuances of those types of things. Mm -hmm. and, and I can fellowship with those people. I mean, we're not, again, the only, only time I'm going to break fellowship with anyone is when they simply deny the authority of Scripture. Right. Where, okay. there, where there's clear, uh, you know, don't do this, and they do it anyway. Sure. All right. Or when they're when they're off on the gospel and they got some wacko something like the social justice thing or mm. or or so much of what you see in the charismatic movement that that uh, just butchers what the gospel is all about and, right. and so forth. Yeah, I mean the Apostle Paul in Galatians one, right? If we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel, let him be a curse. Let him be a curse. So mm -hmm. that, that's where I would draw the line. But okay. yeah, I mean there, there's going to be. There's going to be nuances of things that, okay. that we, we can't be real certain on. You know, I use eschatology as, as one example. There's going to be other people that, you know, some people believe that women should still wear head coverings, and mm -hmm. some people believe that, you know, some of the preferences that women shouldn't wear pants. And, you sure. know, I've, I've seen people in my own church years ago, there was women fighting over, uh, breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding, and mm. you were somehow less spiritual if you didn't breastfeed. And then, and then the home—I mean, the uh, the uh, uh, homeschooling—and sure. I mean, you get all of these types of things. So you're going to have you're going to have lots of different preferences, and you're going to have some nuances of things. There are some people I'm very strong. I believe very much in definite atonement, yeah. and there are other believers that think, no, that's that's not right. Okay, well, we can we can live with that. Sure, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to fight over that type of thing. Sure, but um, but when it comes to again the authority of Scripture and the gospel can't compromise. Okay. Those yeah. are the two issues we want yeah. to hold the line yeah. on. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, uh, let's turn to chapter three where you're, you're addressing regeneration and self-deception. And it's primarily an exposition of Matthew 7. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, while explaining the narrow and the broad ways described in Matthew 7, you explain the term narrow used there. I think it's the word stenos. Uh, would you explain the meaning of that word for us in order to shed greater light on the contrast Jesus is drawing in Matthew 7? Yeah, uh, stenos, as I rec recall, I think it comes from a root word meaning to groan, and it, it's the idea of, of, again, you have a narrow, a narrow gate and a wide gate. You have a mm -hmm. narrow way and a wide way. Uh, he, he later on says, strive to enter through the, the narrow way, right. agonizomai. There's I mean, you don't just kind of wander through that. Right. Uh, there, there is, there, there is a groaning going through that. I mean, you, you have to deal with your sin. Hmm. That's the point. The, na the narrow gate is, is, is the gate of absolute humility. It's the gate of self-denial. It's the gate that, that acknowledges 
that I'm a sinner and I'm in desperate need of saving grace. Okay. The wide gate, everybody kind of wanders through that. Mm. It's it's so much easier. And both say, both gates say this way to heaven. Right. Right. But only one will take you there. Amen. So, okay. and that's why he goes on to make those comparisons that, um, you know, not everybody who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And um, but those who do the will of the Father will. Right. And the will of the Father, of course, is being obedient to the Word of God that can only be empowered by the Spirit of God mm-hmm. because of regeneration and so forth. Um, but he says for the others, you know, even though they say, well, didn't we do all these religious things in your name? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Right. And so self-deception is a very, very dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's what's going on there with Matthew 7. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, on page 66, you say that it is the sad legacy of the consumer-driven mindset of evangelical pragmatism that makes the gospel a product and the preacher a salesman, a concept totally foreign to Scripture. As you might expect, the salesman must make the product appealing to the consumer by presenting it in an atmosphere of entertainment and removing any offense that might prevent the sale. But when the solemnity of the eternal destiny of people's souls is obscured by amusement and the offense of the cross is removed to overcome resistance, the appealing gospel becomes a different gospel that damns both those who embrace it and those who preach it. Why is the biblical gospel offensive? And because nobody wants to hear that they are unable to do anything to contribute to their salvation, that they are, that they are depraved by nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they are purely at the mercy of of a sovereign God because people have a rabid commitment to self-determination. I mean, they just don't want to hear those types of things. Okay. I mean, that's why, you know, when Jesus went through all of that, for example, in John 6, in verse 66, you read that everybody left him, you know? Yeah. All of the people following him, you know, hey, we're out of here. We're, we're not going to buy into this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. You can see all five points of Calvinism, for example, in John mm. 6. And so, I mean, people don't want to hear that type of thing. Yeah. And so um, evangelical pragmatism comes along with a product. Mm-hmm. Now we've got to make this product appealing. And um, we, we don't want you hating Jesus or hating Christianity like happened before when he was here. Right. 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 You know, too bad Jesus didn't understand these things. He could have had a whole lot more. I mean, all these miracles. I mean, if he would have just toned it down a little bit, he could have. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's just it's just so wrong on Mm -hmm. so many counts. Yeah. But but that's what they do to attract people. Mm -hmm. Um, But that is not the gospel that will save. Amen. It will be an offense uh, to to people. I mean, the, the Jews. Uh, found it as you know it was a stumbling block and it was foolishness to the to the Greeks and so forth and mm-hmm. and you're going to have that in non-believers but but to those that are being saved it's the power of God unto salvation you will see that amen and so when the elect hear the truth of God's word God in in that efficacious calling of the Spirit and in regeneration is going to call he, they are going to respond right it is an irresistible compelling thing Mm -hmm. as opposed to you know those that believe that that it's not but but um that's what the true gospel will do amen and so um god's word when you unleash it is going to do one of two things it's either going to harden or soften hearts Mm -hmm. and that's up to god yep Yep, I I think about it in the book of acts after in response to the preaching by the apostles there's this phrase uh, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed that's right it's, um, and isn't that a wonderful thing? It is. I know that grace. I don't yeah. have to sing 14 more verses of Just As I Am to get somebody <laughs> saved. Right. You know, right. I, I can trust God to do that. My role, your role, is to sow the seed of the gospel. Right. Not some hybrid seed that'll grow in concrete. Right. All right? right. But the true seed. Yeah. And some of it's not going to germinate. Mm-hmm. Um, but because God is sovereign over salvation, those seeds that are intended to save his elect will germinate and right. they will be saved. Yeah, amen. I yeah. mean, Jesus in Matthew 16, I will build my church, you know, and the mm-hmm. gates of hell won't prevail against it. So right. uh, we, we, we don't need to alter the message or anything no. like that. He's building his church. No, 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 no. But it, but, but it is offensive to people. I, sure. I get that. And, and yet 
once people are humbled by the reality of their sin, which is a work of God's grace in their heart, mm-hmm. then it becomes precious to them. Right. And that's a miracle in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's Amen. regeneration, you know. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, quoting you in chapter three, you say, talk is cheap. Therefore, obedience is the only reliable indicator of one's faith in Christ. Would you elaborate on that point and help us understand why that's the case, that obedience is the only reliable indicator? Well, it's because if, if you say you are an apple tree, let's see the apples, right? You'll <laughs> right. know them by their fruits. You know, talk is cheap. And a lot of people claim to be Christians, but they don't follow Christ. Yeah. There's nothing Christ-like about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, their, their life is no different than, than people that are unregenerate. Right. And so, you know, what you're looking for is, is a, a person that, that really emulates Christ. You can see Christ-likeness. I mean, you're drawn to these people. Mm-hmm. And you see the, the, the humility and the joy in their life. You see them persevere under great trials, mm-hmm. which is a work of the Spirit. Right. Uh, that's, that's what you're looking for. And it's not something that you have to force and put on. It just happens. I mean, that's what the whole, the whole metaphor of fruit. fruit. I mean, fruit just happens. Right. You know, you don't have to grunt. To, I mean, you don't see the vine, you know, it's working hard. <laughs> and it just it can't help it, you know. It right. just happens. Mm-hmm. And that's the fruit of the Spirit, for example. Mm-hmm. And, uh yeah. In Galatians 5, and uh, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, those things, are you're just going to see that happen. Right. So d- don't just tell me you're a Christian. Let's see you're a Christian. Okay. You know, yeah. that's the point. So in thinking about evidences of regeneration in the heart, obedience to the Lord, a desire to, to honor Him with our lives, uh, love for our neighbor and for the brothers within church, um, all those things are what we're looking for. All those things. And I would say at, at, at the very top, a love for Christ, right. a genuine love for Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he, he becomes the delight of our heart, the, the, the joy of our heart. Uh, we, we, we long to know more of who he is. Mm-hmm. And that love for Christ produces humility, and then we can honestly sing "Amazing Grace" because right. we are amazed at it. Right. And then flowing out of that are the works of righteousness, the fruits of repentance, and you know all of those types of things. Okay. And uh, a love for His Word, a burden for the lost. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you you see uh, a desire to move more and more away from the things of the world, mm-hmm. uh, the lust of the of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. I mean, all those things are of the world and not of the Father. So you'll see all of that type of thing. Sure. That's sure. what you're looking for in okay. your own life, in my life. That's what we look for. Right, right. And then the call of Galatians 6 is if we see someone in not acting in that way, we're to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Absolutely. And thus fulfill the law of Christ, which mm-hmm. is the law of love. Mm-hmm goes on to say that we are to bear one another's burdens, which means we are to help get underneath their burden of sin and help them deal with it. Wow. Okay. That's the idea. That's what true love does. Amen. You know, if I see a brother in Christ and he's wandering off in some weird direction, maybe he's being unkind to his wife and his kids or whatever, because of my love for him, I need to come alongside of him okay. and try to restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Right. Right. You know, so that's that's all what that's all part of what true believers will do. Yeah, it'll be a natural desire of their heart mm-hmm. to do those types of things. And man, it just over and over again, just rehearsing God's grace in regenerating yeah. us, and uh, giving us a love for that which we once hated, and a hatred for the sin we once loved, and then He gifts us with one another uh, yeah. that we Amen. might, you know, help one another along to the celestial city. Amen. Well, brother, I have one more question for you. Uh, uh, in, in the last chapter, you talk at length about the legacy of the American evangelist Charles Finney and the altar call method of evangelism, which he pioneered. For those who maybe aren't familiar with him and his influence on the church, would you mind explaining his methodology and how it has infiltrated the church? And then just as a follow-up, is there any good fruit that has come mm. from it? Boy, that. I mean, we could spend an hour sure. on that. Um, 
I mean, he uh, he was a heretic in so many ways, mm. uh, but uh, he believed that um, again that that man could be uh, manipulated through his emotions to somehow make a decision for Christ. Okay. So the whole idea of all that we're talking about with regeneration, all that he he didn't didn't believe, didn't understand any of that. Hmm. And so he believed that because man is emotional and people are, I mean, it's easy to whip people up into emotion, get them to do the most idiotic things. But uh, he believed that uh, we needed to do that. We need to capitalize on that. And so what we do is, is we present uh, the gospel and we require a person right then and there to make a decision mm. and to validate uh, the, the the transforming power of the gospel and the fact that you've you, you're now saved. You've got to do something, right. and which is to walk the aisle, repeat a prayer. Mm. They used to have anxious benches; people would fall out. I mean, there's all kinds of things. And of course, uh, you'll see that in a lot of crusades where they'll have certain people just kind of. Uh, uh, prime the pump, so to speak. They wow. they go forward to get other people worked up, and and so you get people kind of worked up, and and uh, and they repeat the prayer or whatever it is. And and uh, what's fascinating, if you study what happened with Finney and all the people that that came forward and repeated the prayers and and professed Christ, you'll see. And he even admitted that that you go back a few years later, and mm. you don't see those people following Christ. Right. Uh, you know, they're not coming down to count the cross. You know, they're not, they're not really broken over their sin. Uh, they, they, they don't understand those things. They don't understand the gospel and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that whole altar call, uh, method I think is a, is a very dangerous thing because what tends to happen is people start making decisions out of emotion and they validate the genuineness of their faith based upon that prayer that they re- repeated or whatever. Right. And I'll, I've heard preachers tell them, now don't let anybody ever tell you, you know, that you're not saved because today you got saved. Wow. Well, maybe, mm-hmm. but what validates genuine saving faith is not a profession. Right. It's not <clears throat> something that walking an aisle or whatever, uh, it's, it's the fruit in your life. Mm-hmm. And that's what you look for. So, I mean, even in our church, when somebody claims that they've come to saving faith, I rejoice. You know, love believes all things, but mm-hmm. I'm also guardedly optimistic. I want to yeah. kind of wait and see, right. you know, do we see some fruits here and, right. and, and so forth. So that whole, that whole system, that whole errant theology that was a part of Phineism has continued on down through the years. Mm-hmm. And I've just seen so many people uh, make some profession of faith and 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 they, they they really didn't know what they were doing right they just kind of uh, did what everybody else was doing and got, got caught up in the emotion and I've, I've I've got a number of pieces we've got a number of people in our church that got saved out of that okay who will tell you that yeah who will give examples of that mm-hmm. and the same thing in the charismatic movement where they were taught to speak in tongues as if you know, if, if that's the gift, you right, know, right. Uh, and all of those types of things. So, sure. so there's lots of problems with that. And I, yeah. I fear that, um, uh, that that is a very, very dangerous method mm-hmm. rather than just trusting God to use the gospel rather than taking over for the spirit of God and saying, you know, Hey, I'll handle this. Right. I'll get this person to make a decision. Right. Right. You know, yeah. I would rather let the Spirit of God do His work. Amen. Yep. I, that's almost blasphemous to put it that way, but you mm-hmm. understand what I'm saying. I do. Yeah. 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 Well, brother, thank you for your time and for your insight here. I had I had one one thing I wanted to read just in closing. It's a quote from uh, let's see, a London theologian and pastor, John Gill, uh, mm-hmm. dealing with regeneration. Here you say, or it says, the first birth is of sinful parents and in their image. The second birth is of God and in His image. The first birth is of corruptible. The second birth is of incorruptible seed. The first birth is in sin. The second birth is in holiness and righteousness. By the first birth, men are polluted and unclean. By the second birth, they become holy and commence to be saints. 
The first birth is of the flesh and is carnal. The second birth is of the spirit and is spiritual and makes men spiritual men. By the first birth, men are foolish and unwise, being born like a wise donkey's colt. By the second birth, they become knowing and wise unto salvation. By the first birth, they are slaves to sin and the lusts of the flesh, are home-born slaves. And by the second birth, they become Christ's free men. Amen. Praise God. Thank yes, you, brother. Good, good. Thank you. Well, thank you all for listening to another episode of the Fortified Podcast with author and pastor Dr. David Harrell. For more books, resources, and sermons, please visit shepherdsfire.org. And until next time, God bless.